Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, um, we priests have a lot of kids in a manner of speaking. Um, you know, I just felt like I was uh, for six years. My first six years as a priest, I was um, a chaplain at Scotia Central Catholic, and so we had 400 kids there, right? And I always would kind of laugh with parents, be like, "Yeah, I got 400 teenagers. So um, you want to talk about problems? We got problems." <laughs> so, <laughs> no, that's awesome, Father Norman. Thanks so much. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit. I'm so glad. I was just about to prepare a talk completely on constitutive blessings, and I just turned away at the last moment. So we're good. It is one of the great perks, I would say, of being a priest, is that you can bless anything. You know, I, I just, if I want, it's blessed. You know, um, the one thing I would tell my students was that uh, I can't bless. Like, if they're, not, if they're not used things for evil, you don't bless that. But other than that, it's all fair game, you know? So, so no cocaine, but everything else is pretty much good. Like, we're good. No, it's great. Sorry, that's kind of random. Uh, forgive me. <laughs> I know you were wondering. Um, you know, um, it has been awesome to watch this uh, ministry really take root, YCP, to watch it thrive in so many ways. I, I love it. Um, for those of you who are new here, um, it, it'll be good for you to know that it's not usually a priest that speaks. Um, uh, in fact, it's one of the things I've, I've appreciated so much. You know, we uh, as priests, we, we have the privilege, I think, of being able to, to, to preach and speak an awful lot and, and get to know people, the people who you are speaking to and that you're preaching to. You know their stories. You know what's going on in their life to, to greater or lesser degrees. And um, I don't know, you kind of wonder sometimes, like you look out at people and you think, gosh, you know, if I bet you could give with what you've been through and what I know you've been through, like your homilies would be pretty amazing, you know? Like I would love to hear you speak. Not necessarily give up. I mean, I know it's to the ordained and all that. I get that. But I would love to hear you witness to what God's done in your life. And I think YCP gives us just beautiful way for people who have done some amazing things or have been through some real trials, who have been really successful, I think, in a variety of ways. Um, to speak about what the Lord has done in their life. And it's so important and it's so edifying to me to hear that. So whether it's an executive or a police officer or um, whatever it happens to be, like it, it's, it's really been a glorious thing. And it's a beautiful way for all of us to share. Um, as the first priest to have had the honor to, to speak with you, um, I figured it'd be good to talk about some real fundamental things. So maybe not so much constitutive blessings, um, but rather just why this Jesus thing is so valuable and so important, like why it's so needed. Um, and, you know, um, I'll tell some stories from my own experience, and I know that my life is in many ways different from yours. Um, but I think there are usually parallels um, to what goes on in my heart as I experience things as a priest, to what goes on in your heart, to what goes on in your mind, to what goes on in your soul um, as you go through life. And so just today, I'd just like to speak a little bit about, I don't know, the basic attitude of Christianity and um, why I think that's so needed. I think it's been needed at every point in history. I think that's what, why Jesus came, is to give us a new way of being and thinking. And I, I just want to try to break that open a little bit in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, you know, um, <laughs> I was ordained, and uh, my first job was not real exciting to me when I first heard about it. I received a letter, I was told I'd go to Scota Central Catholic in Columbus, Nebraska. I was told um, that I would be teaching eighth graders and seniors. And part of what was a little bit hard for me was the fact that uh, I was once an eighth grader myself. And I was, I was, I was a horrible person, um, a really wretched little human being. And, um, and I was really bad to a lot of people, including the priest who would visit our classroom. Um, just we, we mocked him um, just without end and without mercy, really. And so as I was going through seminary, one of the things I, I found myself saying was, you know, Lord, I'm really, I'm open to just about anything, but junior high would be a good one for me to avoid. Um, <laughs> and, and so, of course, that was my first assignment, right? Of course. Um, and, and I arrived, and, you know, I found myself having... Um, I had actually a really good year. I came to love it. And actually, one of the, the highlights of my day ended up being eighth grade. But for those of us who have maybe begun a job, or if you've begun, especially if you know teaching, um, then you know that the first year is always, um, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's rough in a lot of ways. 
you, you survive it, and then hopefully you improve for the next year. Um, near the end of that year, uh, the seniors would get out of classes a week before everyone else, and then they'd have time to get ready for their graduation parties and things like that. And I found myself, I was so grateful that um, my seniors, I taught them every day, that that class was, was done, and I had time to get ready for graduation and everything that was gonna come with that. And one of the responsibilities of the priest at SCOTUS was that you had to give the commencement address at graduation. And so I was kind of like, you know, like, man, like moms and dads are gonna be there, grandma and grandpa's gonna be there, like this is a big deal, right? And so I'm sitting in my office sometime early in the week, and these two seniors come up. I don't know what they, they were there for some reason or whatever, but these two girls come into my office. I'm like, Father, you must miss us. What are you doing these days? And I'm like, oh, man, you know, you have nothing to do. We're, we're gone. You're not teaching us. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm just, I'm just really trying hard to get ready for, you know, commencement and this big talk and all this kind of thing. And <laughs> their response, I'll never forget it, was like instantaneous. It was like, Father, who cares? <laughs> like, <laughs> Like, and they kind of made fun of me then. They're like, Father, like, do you really think we're going to remember what you say? I, um, you know, like in 20 years, are we actually going to be like talking like, oh, Father Rosa's talk at commencement was so amazing. And then, anyways, I was like, wow, that's, that's nice. Um, <laughs> thanks, thanks, that's great. Um, <laughs> so I, I was really mad. You can imagine. I mean, it was, I was really upset. And I, so I went down to the chapel, and I just sat down there in, the, in front of the tabernacle, and um, I can remember thinking, like, what am I doing, you know? Like, what's the point of all this? Like, why, why do I do all this work if nobody remembered? Like, I, the thing I realized very quickly was that they were, they were right. They were right. It didn't matter. They were right. <laughs> and as I thought about it, I was like, I don't, I mean, how many homilies do I remember? Especially from high school. I think I remember one from high school. I mean, I went to seminary, I went to mass every day for five years, um, you know, and I, I think I remember two or three homilies from that whole time, every day, you know? And I was like, why do I do all this work? And why do I worry and spend all this time if like, actually nobody's gonna actually remember it, anything <laughs> of it, you know? And you know what was kind of neat is that that was a really important moment for me, like for me to go before the Lord and for him to teach me a lot about myself. And the first lesson I think that I learned from it was, uh, you know, Andy, um, it really, you might not remember it, but uh, what they will remember is the fact that you showed love and attention and care. If you go up there and wing it and don't have any clue what you're going to say, that's going to reflect on you and on your relationship with them. You have to do the work and show them love. Like, you, you have to do it. Right? I was like, okay, I can work with that. But I think the other thing that I learned from that that was kind of important for me um, was this realization that I was really, really selfish. <laughs> you know, like that what I was worried, I was really nervous, I was really concerned, and why was I so worried and why was I so concerned? I was concerned because, like, what are people going to say about this talk? Are they going to like it? Is it going to be good enough for them? Are they going to tell me how great I am afterwards? Are they going to do all these things? Which has nothing to do with loving them. Like, it has nothing to do with serving them or with helping them to know Jesus better or helping them to have a better day. It was, it was a lot about, uh, about me. And I had to come to, to face that and, like, recognize that. Like, that all those areas, like, I had all these fears and all these concerns. Like, I recognized that in my own heart, I was trying to be something that I didn't need to be. Like, I was trying to be, like, super priest, right? Like, the guy who makes you laugh and then you cry and you think deep thoughts and, you are, and, it's, and you're very prayerful by the end. And then you leave the church and you say, Father, you're just the most swell of them all. You know? <laughs> like you're, you're, you're just the very best. Which, again, has nothing to do with their actual well-being. It has everything to do with, like, you know, myself. And the reality is that as I reflected on that, as I thought about it, as I prayed to that, and I grew with that, like, I learned some really important things about what really matters. You know, I, I think that all of us, as I prayed with that, I wasn't too mad at myself or anything. I think most of us experience that to some degree or another, you know? If you do something, you want people to appreciate it. You want people to appreciate your efforts. You bake a cake, you want people to like it, right? Um, you make some art, you want people to say, hey, that's nice, right? Um, you, you want to, like, if you put effort into something, you want people to recognize it, you want them to like it. You don't want them to be like, oh, that was stupid, right? 
is you recognize, like, so you, you invest in certain things. Now, I guess the point that it comes to is understanding the way that you or I invest in it and making sure that we invest in it in the right way, like that we invest in it out of love as opposed to investing in it out of some kind of insecurity or fear that people will judge us or not like us or not think it's good enough or, or whatever it happens to be, you know? Like, as Christians, we have this fundamental belief that, that Jesus came to be with us, right? And that he offers us something really unique, okay? that he offers us a different way of looking at our sense of who we are, of, of why our life matters, of, of, of what will actually give us value. And I think that's the fundamental point that you want to look at and that we want to look at in every area of our lives is like, what is it or where is it that we're really seeking the sense of our own worth or our own value, you know? Like, at the depths of my heart, how do I want to be valued? Do I want to be valued because I'm a person and I'm just loved as a person and meant to be loved that way? Or do I want to be valued because I'm really smart? Do I want to be really valued because I'm really successful? Do I want to be really valued because I'm really attractive? Do I want to be really valued because I'm really funny? Do I want to be really valued because, and you can just go on down the line forever and ever and ever and ever, right? With all these different qualities. And the thing that we notice is that whenever I'm really looking for value in something that can't really fully give it to me, I'm going to probably end up on a path that leads me to a lot of stress or a lot of fear or maybe a lot of jealousy. Like in preparing for a talk, you know? If people don't really approve of it, you know, then what's the fear that's leading me to become nervous, right? The fear that people will say, you're just terrible or whatever, or, or it's not good enough, or you know, you, you're not competent, or whatever happens to be. And, and where that leads me spiritually, right? That if I'm not good enough, if I'm not competent enough, then I won't be like worthy of love, like I won't have value. And I know that sounds kind of crazy when you say it out loud, but that's kind of how our hearts work, you know? I worked with adolescents a lot, right? And so what are the, what's a primary drive for teenagers? Like a primary drive for teenagers is friendship. You know, like, and that's a good drive. It's a good desire. Like, you got to have friendship and connection, that sense of unity. But you could see where, like, if that were taken the wrong way, it could lead them to a lot of real struggles, right? So if my main desire is friendship, then that means that if I fear losing my friend, like, I'm going to do anything to keep that, right? I will compromise anything in order to maintain these friendships. Like, I can be led into all kinds of areas that are really, really grim and really, really sad, right? And it's the same way. Like, if I say, like, look, my value depends upon having a lot of money, then, well, what's that going to tempt me to, you know? Like, that's going to tempt me to using people who get in the way of my ability to gain that, right? It's going to tempt me towards being dishonest in, in seeking it. It's going to tempt me towards things that, that aren't good. And you see that on an extreme level, how that creates injustice, right? Like, you look at Wall Street, right? The whole crash. Okay? People who put money in front of everything else. And they're tempted to all these things. And they're not honest about it. They make up these situations that can't be maintained. And then you, you have something that affects negatively, like, billions of people. Literally, billions of people. Right? You look at another area. Like, if people are seeking value, as I think many people do today, I think somewhat, um, I don't know, I don't judge them for it, but there's that sense in which I won't have value unless I can experience sexual pleasure. Right? or something like that. And you look at the injustice and the dysfunction that can come forth from that kind of feeling, that kind of emotion. Like, if I'm not able to experience this, then would life even be worth living? I mean, you look at the reality, the injustice of something like human trafficking. And it's, it's unbelievable to me, I, just to consider for a brief second, that like, there are apparently millions of people who um, would rather others be physically and spiritually enslaved, I mean literally, physically, spiritually enslaved, rather than tame their own passions and desires. You know? Like that's an, uh, that's an unreal level of slavery or attachment to a created good, right? Look, uh, every type of attachment, every type of way of saying, my value will come from this certain thing that's not God, leads to, in its extreme, really, really terrible injustice. 
Jesus came to bring about a right ordering of things. You know, he came to bring about a new way of being, like a new form of real justice, right? And the way that he proposes to do that is actually just by letting you get off like the treadmill of seeking love and all these other things, seeking love and approval of others, seeking love and all these, seeking value and all these other things, by simply saying to you, 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 are, you are unconditionally loved. And in that, your heart can rest, right? You know, I like the word redemption. You know, like this coupon can be redeemed and it has X value at such and such place, right? It's amazing, you cut that little piece of paper out, it's, it has no value whatsoever until you take it to one place, and then it's like magic. It just does things for you, you know? Coupons are amazing, right? And coupons can only be redeemed at certain places, you know? Like they have value at certain places, right? And this idea is like where you seek your value. Like what is it that gives you value? Where is it that we are trying to take our heart, our coupon, <laughs> and have it redeemed, have it given value, you know? God is so beautiful, I think, because the message that is so good that Jesus provides really is the fact that, like, you are, you are a beloved son. Like, you are a favored son or a favored daughter, you know? Like, you are loved regardless of your competence or attractiveness or anything else that might, you might choose to judge your own worth by or find your own worth in. Like, you are beyond that. Jesus is baptized by the Father, or by, excuse me, by John the Baptist, yeah, and, and the voice of the Father comes out, though, and it says, like, look, you are my beloved son, and you, I am well pleased. And the glorious truth, the really freeing truth is that, like, you're part of the body of Christ, right? Like, that's what baptism is. That's what it does. Like, you're in Jesus. So everything the Father says of Jesus can be applied to you, whether you like it or not. You are a beloved son. <laughs> you are a beloved daughter. And your job as a Christian is just to take it. <laughs> like, just sit there and take it. Let him love you, you know? That's really what it comes down to, whether it's in confession or whether it's in the sacraments or whether it's sitting there, in the, you know, in, in prayer. Like, your job is just to sit there and let him love you. That's it. And, and to adore you, really, whether you deserve it or not. I mean, you have to remember, when you go before God, like, this is the God who revealed himself in the story of the prodigal son, right? And the prodigal father, right? The prodigal son does all kinds of ridiculous, dumb things, horrible things, right? And he goes back, and what he says to his father when he comes back, he's like, I don't deserve anything. Like, I, I'd be happy to just be a slave and try to make up some of what I've lost, you know, to you. And what is it that God does? God is like, no, like, come up here. Like, I'm going to give you everything, right? I'm going to restore you completely. So when you go into prayer, what's your job? Your job is just sit there and take it. <laughs> let him adore you. Let yourself be adored. Like, sit on the lap of your father and just let him be like, yeah, I love you. Deal with it. All right? <laughs> that's our job. Like, that's the job. It really is just that simple. And the point is that as Jesus comes into that and loves you in a way that's totally unconditional, all of a sudden, all those other things that you might be tempted and I might be tempted to seek value and seek worth in fade away. Right? And then all of a sudden, I can act out of what? Like, out of the same unconditional love that the Father has for me that I've experienced for myself, I can begin to give to other people, right? I can begin to share that with other people. I can begin to love in a way that's not really even humanly possible in the first place. Like, I can do more than I ever would have before. And that's like the liberating truth. You know, I think the way that um, it's stated by the folks at the Institute for Priestly Formation, who do awesome work, if you read any of their materials, it's good. I know it's the Institute for Priestly Formation, but it's, it's just spirituality. It's great stuff. But the way that they put it is um, relationship, identity, and mission, right? Does your relationship with God lead to your sense of identity, your sense of value, and have that lead to what you're supposed to do and be and how you're supposed to be? Like, does your relationship with God form who you are? And if it does that, then I think no matter what situation you're in, you have a lot to offer to people because you bring peace of mind and heart, you bring perspective, you're not really prone as much to pettiness or gossip. You're a much more trustworthy person, right? You're calm in the face of adversity. And my guess is that if I'm hiring somebody, I'd probably appreciate somebody who could, you know, have those qualities. Somebody who's not gonna angle for stuff, um, but who will like kind of like look me in the eye and tell me what's up and what's real. Like those are qualities that are appreciated. And that if you have them sincerely, genuinely, authentically, will, I think, make you a person of greater value. 
And you know what? If you're in a workplace that doesn't accept that, then my guess is that the Lord will help you find a place that does, and it'll be a lot better, you know? So relationship, identity, mission. Who are you? And how does that lead you to what you do? If you start the other way, mission, identity, relationship, if you allow what you're doing and what you're accomplishing to lead your sense of self, you will end up um, anxious, depressed, worried, jealous, sorrowful, right? There's no way around it. I really like um, that idea of relationship, identity, mission, or redemption, identity, mission, in part because um, the letters work together in a way that I, I, I have come to, I guess, enjoy. I think of rims, I think of things that make cars go. Well, you know, you move faster, right? Relationship, identity, mission. You remain in the Lord. You remain in me, R I M. You move forward. Um, MIR is actually um, kind of an interesting thing. I, I studied in Rome. I did my theology in Rome, and I had the chance to travel a lot while I was there. One of the trips I made was to Russia. I went to Moscow, and um, I got to see a lot of the communist architecture and sort of the fruits of what that society had brought about. And in many ways, it was, it was a hard thing to see. The concepts that was present in Russian society was the word mir, M-I-R. Okay? And that word, I don't, it, means, it means a lot of things in Russian. It means peace. And it means community, so town, peace, town, and nation can mean all those things. And it was like the key theme word of the Soviet Union, right? It was like their theme word. Their like rallying cry was that we're going to be this, this society of peace and of justice, right? Because we're going to get things right, we're going to do it right, and then everything else will follow from there. The only thing they left out was God, right? Like they totally took God out of the equation. And of course, the whole thing failed. Right? And by the end of the Soviet Union, what you have are these images of people in bread lines. You know, like they just need the basics, like bread and toilet paper and stuff, and they're waiting in line for hours to get these things. So it's this situation where they thought, gosh, we can do it all right if we just order it right, we get all the ideas right, we do everything correctly, but it had no soul. <laughs> and it led to this kind of degradation of, of everything. You know, God wants for you to, what, live abundantly, right? to have all good things. Um, he wants for you to come to the feast that is heaven, right? It's the opposite of a bread line, you know? Living and taking your identity from the things that you accomplish, the things that you do, from your mission, is kind of the equivalent of a spiritual bread line. Like you're working really, really hard, and all you're getting are the crumbs, you know? If you start with who you are as God sees you, and you allow that to define you, like, you will find that your whole life will just be tremendously abundant. That has certainly been true in my own life to the extent that I have been able to live out of that real identity, that real sense of who I am. And I've known enough lay people um, to know that it has really, really done the trick in their life, too. And so my urging of you would be to pray with it and to just take it. <laughs> Let the Lord adore you because that's exactly what he wants to do and if you find yourself resisting if you find yourself saying no I don't deserve it well that's breadline thinking right you're not a Soviet take it take the love right take the love don't tell him what he's not capable of doing let him adore you and if you live from that um, yeah you will find life to be radically and beautifully transformed. Thanks, guys, for your attention. I appreciate it. <laughs>